you very much. So I'm very excited to be here, first of all, because the speaker lineup is something out of my dreams. It's either my friends or people that I always wanted to see again or people I always wanted to meet. So I'm really keen like, for what's happening this week. Thanks very much, IPAM as well. And secondly, I'm excited and also slightly nervous because in the last three years, I've actually not given talks at all, if I could help it, really the bare minimum. And the reason for that was that I had a growing feeling of um, unease with the literature in quantum machine learning, especially in the field of thinking about how quantum computers can be used for machine learning. And this unease was also reflected in my own research. I always had this feeling something was missing. There was an elephant in the room that we don't address that there were problems. And so um, this is now the first talk where I want to present a bit of work where I'm very confident again that this is going into the right direction. So I spent the last couple of years, besides having a child, there's another one on the way, so a bit of family stuff as well. But I spent a lot of the last years really thinking about how to verbalize these issues that are kind of felt. And secondly, how to build a research agenda that uh, addresses them or circumvents them or sometimes is a little bit different. And this is, um, so what I want to present here are preliminary results from two pilot studies in two focus areas that we're now kind of following Xanadu. And um, so the reason why I could spend so much time in actually thinking about a conceptual version and also you know, not publish a lot, not go to talks a lot, is that um, I was uh, you know, asked to build a little quantum machine learning team at Xanadu and a lot of the credits go to those folks here. This is the core team, this is a bit more the larger circle. If you like what you hear here, then consider working for us. It's a very sweet team and we have um, What's well, an opportunity and curse, we are all remote. Um, so, yeah. Okay, cool. The first thing I realized in the last couple of years, speaking to also people like, for example, Ryan, or like a couple of you in the audience, is that these concerns that I have come from the objective that I'm trying to optimize. And you might not share this objective, but the first thing I have to do is be open with this objective. I'm working in industry. Um, Xanadu's mission is to build quantum computers that are useful and available to people everywhere. And this hides what the company actually does. Most of the company is building a photonic quantum computer, but a large uh, part of the team is actually trying to build software that makes them available and hopefully a joy to program. You might have heard of Penny Lane. And I'm part of the uh, software team leading this little quantum machine learning team that's trying to make these computers useful. And so the derived mission or objective that we're working on is to make computers useful for machine learning. And this sounds now like a bit of industrial babble, but it's actually not. It's a very precisely and consciously formulated objective. And what you do not see here is that we want to prove a practical quantum advantage, because this is something completely different. What we're doing here is envisioning a state of the world. This is something that you do in startups a lot, and I learned from it, and I find it actually quite an interesting way of working. You envision a state of the world, maybe in 10 years' time, where the typical machine learning practitioner doesn't only have specialized knowledge on how to program a GPU or on linear algebra, but also needs to know quantum computing. And the question is, how do we get there from here? So this is an industrial question. It doesn't mean to understand the world. It means to change the world. But I wouldn't do it if it wouldn't encompass also like a lot of understanding the world, obviously. And now the question is, you look at the field, and you have, especially when you're building a team, and you have to give them something to do. And... Um, the question is now with the models that also Nathan had this wonderful introduction to, are we actually on the right path? So basically, if we extrapolate, our computers get better, our models get a little bit better, we tune a bit here and there, will we get to the state of the world? And my answer to this is, if we formulate it nicely, we need to, a lot of things have to change in research for us to be on the right path. Obviously, I can't predict the future, but um, let's put it like that. If I would put my money or my good name or something to a path, then I would say, let's not choose those, let's change a couple of things. Um, also, I have to say, when I talk about quantum machine learning, in the back of my mind, I have this like very mainstream approach that Nathan was also talking about. We load data into a quantum computer, we kind of uh, run some kind of variational algorithms, and then it gives us like kind of the answer of a machine learning task, which is a kind of narrow approach to quantum machine learning in general. I'm sure we discuss a lot more facets of it. So let me try to phrase four patterns that I see in the literature and in my own kind of work that I started feeling uneasy about. And I think I make myself very, um, well, I don't know if I make some enemies here, but the first one um, is the pattern of we prove an exponential speed up in QML. And actually even Nathan, who's like, knows everything about speed ups, was saying like, maybe this is not the right approach. I was actually like, I loved a couple of like comments in the talk. Why is this so problematic? So from an academic point of view, you can play this game. But again, it's problematic if you want quantum computers to be used for machine learning one day on a grand scheme. 
And the point is that the language of computational complexity is not used in machine learning. If you go to Europe, you hear very few people like talking about exponential speedups. And the reason is that this language cannot really formulate or phrase what we see in current state-of-the-art machine learning. So this language is not useful for current state-of-the-art machine learning. Another way to phrase this is machine learning is happening in heuristics. And this is a problem. And we should acknowledge that this is a problem for the language that we have learned and inherited from quantum computing. So I do think that our performance measures in this sense, our theoretical ones, are to some extent not meaningful to get good results in machine learning. And I put here mainstream machine learning because when I discuss this with people, they always say, yeah, but what, are, what about quantum data? Maybe there are tasks that machine learning hasn't tackled yet. And there again, I think Nathan has dropped a very interesting comment. In the last weeks, I looked a little bit into transformer models and like what's actually happening in state-of-the-art machine learning. And I'm not actually sure that they can't solve a lot of our problems in quantum physics because they learn in a very interesting manner, kind of very complicated correlations. Physics problems are simple. There's low energy involved in most of the things we do. They're very structured. Why on earth shouldn't they be able to learn most of them, except from a couple exotic cases? But again, my idea is not to prove that there's an exotic case where things will happen. I want this to be mainstream, so that's the object. Yeah. The second pattern is also related to performance. So if we don't go to quantum computing as our parent discipline, the answer is no. No, the answer is yes. Is it is it fair to say that a, 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 a proposed a machine learning algorithm that is only polynomially slower than a, a quantum solution is actually quantum? Because it can be simulated in polynomial time then, or polynomial equivalent time on a Turing machine. Oh my gosh, this question, can you phrase it again and like tell me the context of why this is right now? Oh, yes. the context is a shit talking yeah. from the previous slide. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the basic thing is, is that if we have a black box, mm -hmm. right, we can't stare inside the black box mm -hmm. to be able to determine whether or not it's a uh, quantum computer mm -hmm. or it's a D-wave quantum computer. Okay. <laughs> so if we don't know whether or not it's classical or a quantum computer, um, then how can we tell from the input-output pairs if it's only a polynomial separation between it, because then it becomes, uh, there's no clear indication that we couldn't just be secretly simulating everything going on inside. Okay. <laughs> yes. Can we talk about this afterwards? It leads into a very different topic, and I don't know if I entirely understand the problem here. Okay. Yeah. Do you, I'm not cutting you off. I'm really okay. just like yeah, I'll, affirming I'll, I'll, that I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm not I'll, on the level I'll, where this I'll is happening. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Cool. Second pattern. Um, I'm actually quite impressed. Do they have uh, cameras on yes. the videos on the toilet or something so that you can just come kind of <laughs> Very good. Okay, second, uh, second the pattern. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you know me quite well. Oh, no. So, a second pattern is um, you know, we uh, look at performance from a machine learning angle. What we do here is, okay, heuristics, so we start benchmarking. Uh, so a lot of papers like run little benchmarks, there's always the sentence where we start testing things on MNIST or whatever. And the big elephant in the room, I think, here is that um, machine learning has different regimes. And I think that small problems in machine learning um, are solved and have a very different working reality than big problems. And the big problems, remember, again, this is like what we're trying to solve here. So we don't actually know from the benchmarks that are so small at the moment what happens on larger scales. And also, if you have ever trained a neural network on very, or a very performant neural network on small problems, they're actually performing really badly often. So there seems to be something going on. And at this stage in time, it's very hard to change this, but we could be a lot more aware in our research asking questions, what benchmarks can we actually design that are designed to actually probe models on a larger scale? Um, there's another issue, actually, that... Um, is so kind of like guesswork that I just want to share it with you, but um, you know, I need to see data if this is really true. I think we have a huge positivity bias in quantum machine learning. And I know everyone's like claiming this, but um, I work on my Fridays. I actually, since forever, I don't work in quantum computing, but I work with classical machine learning. Um, I work with a group of social psychologists, and they shared with me that in 20, around 2010, I think it was, in their field, they had a huge scandal because a huge collaboration of people who started feeling really uneasy about research sat down and tried to reproduce studies that people did in social psychology and found almost zero rep reproducibility. So people have built their Harvard careers on something that you couldn't reproduce. 
And so I start wondering if someone shouldn't do this. And you will see that we might actually like, start doing something like this. And we have very <laughs> interesting findings that I'll share just now. So this was more about performance. There's the third pattern. This is more about model design. Again, these are, these are patterns that worry me. I don't know if they worry you. Um, and this is that in a paper that uses variational models for quantum machine learning, at some stage there's always this place where you introduce the circuit. And then there's always a statement like, we use a Pauli gate and some entanglers and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. I challenge you to find papers where there's a logical explanation of why they use this <laughs> circuit and not another one. So sometimes you find a paper that has some design principles that they optimize. But those design principles are, in 99% of the case, derived from quantum physics. So we want a circuit that's not... Uh, you know, that incorporates a model class that's uh, classically intractable. Or we want a model class that's like universal of some sorts, or it's easy to implement in hardware. But these design principles are not coming from machine learning. And so like, um, and this is for me, like this really became apparent in work I did with Ryan and Johannes, but also like many of you will know this, you can build a crazy ansatz that you plug into your quantum machine learning model, and it's a really useless machine learning model in the end. You can have a crazy circuit that only gives you a sign function in the end. So, yeah. Yes? Um, so, uh, one thing that you often hear is uh, expressibility. We want our circuit to be, express, be able to express the whole Hilbert space. Is that a machine learning perspective, or is it not? I think this is super difficult because, um, so first of all, quantum expressibility, so can we express any unitary, is not, I think. Because, again, you can build expressive models that are very, very limited functions. If you say that your quantum models, and I think the latest papers don't fall into this trap anymore, they're actually talking about, you know, we want to express all function classes. And expressibility, if you ever looked into the theory of machine learning, is a very, very subtle topic. Because what classical machine learning theory was about is actually, for, for many, many years, was to find this balance between very expressive models and very simple models so that you regularize well. So it's actually the focus of a lot of theory, and definitely in classical machine learning, more expressivity is not at all better. I think this comes from people just reading about deep learning and these models are very expressive, but only because they're interpolating your data and still doing well does not mean that all of a sudden expressibility, expressivity is actually a good thing. So this is very complicated to talk about and use as a measure. Yeah. yeah. How do you um, streamline your answers when you design it? Like um, which parameter is important, which is not, or maybe I can rephrase, uh, if any like classical techniques that can be useful here to reduce the parameters? Yeah, don't know. So this is in all these patterns, they're always based on uh, a problem that we can't, often can't do better, but I think we can analyze better and we can be more honest. So for example, the previous slide, also we cannot benchmark in high dimensions, but we can actually talk about this. And here again, you can't, I don't know, I've never found in classical machine learning a principle that you can now use to design your answers. It's very subtle, but we have to like start thinking about this. In my world, you will see just now, so the answer that I'm trying to find to this is to design uh, models from first principles more. Know that there's a mechanism in there that is interesting, and then see how well it does, instead of just closing your eyes and hoping that a quantum model does. I did, when I started with this in 2017, I trained the first quantum neural networks, which is really like a long time ago. I mean, even parameter shift rules weren't really invented then yet. And um, at the beginning, I thought like, maybe this is just like magically gonna happen. And this is where the frustration come, came in over the years, where I realized, these are not working for me out of the box. I don't know if anyone, when I speak to students, they often like agree with me, but if I try to train a quantum neural network, it doesn't work out of the box. If I use a scikit-learn model, it works out of the box. And there's a discrepancy between what I see in the literature, this is why I think there's a positivity bias, and what I see in my own research. So, okay, I gave a long answer to an additional question, so yeah. Yes? So I think I have a handle on the first two patterns you described, but I'm not sure I understand this one. It, it, yeah. Would you like to see more uniformity in the kinds of models that people use? Or what do you mean exactly? I have yeah. some sense of what you mean when you say that the, the circuit ensembles are motivated by the physics. But when yeah. you'd like to see it more motivated by the, the learning, that's where I don't understand. Yes, so I want to know why on earth are using this ansatz and not another one. I want to know also that you test what another ansatz would do, for example, in your benchmarks. So okay, like if you cherry pick an ansatz on which the performance is good and it's not necessarily well motivated in and of itself. Yes, or just forget about the concept of an ansatz in a variation circuit in general, but try to get an algorithm that is more handmade or where there's a property in there that you know. I get to this actually in the second part as well. Yeah, thank you. Yes. 
So, so is the point somehow to do with this? Um, so you mentioned expressibility in, in the classical machine learning circumstance, where uh, there is kind of a contradiction between too much expressibility and overfitting. Mm -hmm. So there's some rigidity or some kind of uh, regularity that is required mm -hmm. of the of the approximating function, right? That prevents mm -hmm. it from overfitting. Is that what you what you're exactly? About? And you know, I mean, a Gaussian a support vector machine with a Gaussian kernel can express any function. I mean, it's cool, but it still doesn't do deep learning at this stage. So, yeah. Um, cool. And then the last pattern, I think this might make you, <laughs> I think this attacks a bit more the, the work of all of us here in the room. And this is the one that frustrated the hell out of me because I love working in theory and there's so much beautiful machine learning theory. So, for example, one thing I really loved is the spectra analysis of kernels. So I thought maybe we can do this with quantum kernels. Or statistical physics of learning. There was actually a workshop here a couple of years ago that was fantastic, blew my mind. Start working with these scientists. At some stage, they asked me, okay, we can now analyze quantum models, but what model class would you actually like to analyze? Now, going back to the last slide, I could now take one of, um, you know, Nathan's um, feature maps. They make a big difference of what I take. I could just arbitrarily take one of them and start analyzing. Um, but what people actually do a lot in theory that you see is a pattern where they start with, when, when I see this in a paper, I always like saying, like, okay, this is the pattern. We consider our model class trace row M, which means any embedding, any quantum computation, maybe not any quantum computation, but a very, very large class of anything I could do in the world. And then I prove a theorem. I prove that, you know, if I kind of approximate this, like, uh, or I have a, a kind of randomly sampled model out of this class that I have barren plateaus. I prove, for example, Amira's, we were here from Amira, like a beautiful results on there's no back propagation scaling in general happening, or a lot of cool theory on my kernel decompositions, you know. But the point is that all of these results might not even hold for the models we should care about. So if quantum computing in general can't have can't be trainable, can't have backpropagation scaling. And the, the discussion in the end of your talk was going in that direction. Then, okay, so be it. But there might be a model class that is actually good. And if you think about classical machine learning, we do not prove lots of things about any probability distribution that I could parameterize. We start proving things about neural networks. So we have a very different um, situation than in deep learning. In deep learning, we know a model that we are interested in and we build theory about it. Now we copy this theory and analyze a rather large or arbitrary class of models. So this is like starting, was starting to drive me insane. So I stopped any kind of investigation about, you know, what par parameterized circuits actually are in terms of quantum models. And this was work I did kind of a lot before. Okay, so now I have destroyed a lot. And in the last years, I always gave these talks that was the negative. So let me know. Yes. I, about the patterns, I was wondering, yeah. could you comment briefly about to, to what extent these patterns exist in classical machine learning? Because I think some of them yeah. ought to. Like, there is a separation between theory and practice. I think data sets and papers aren't publicly available a lot of the time. And I think only the third one, to be honest. So the first one, that we use computational complexity, that we use basically ways to a language that doesn't suit the reality. I think people have actually given up using that language. I mean, we do a lot of benchmarking there. The second one, we can benchmark in the big regime, so that's not a problem. The third one, a bit that models are, no, also the third one is not true, because the models are verified by their success. So we know we should analyze these models because they're doing well. And now the last one is we're doing actually theory about the models that are doing well, so we don't have this arbitrariness. So I don't think actually any pattern applies there. Yes? I have a question of how on earth are you going to um, see what the blue field is, right? How yeah. do we find out what are the relevant issues? And so, yeah. I try to go, what we say, across Green Street and talk to our experimentalist. Yeah. It takes 10 years and I'm not a lot wiser. Yes. So how on earth are you going to find out where the blue spot is? Okay, um, I'll try, no, I'll come to this now actually, yeah. Um, so this is kind of like what I'm trying, so now I'm sitting there, I'm starting a team and I want to work on something. So I could, I could actually hire any team, right? What specialist do I need? What field do I want to go in? Especially if I'm so frustrated myself about a lot of things. So what on earth do we set up? And so we arrived at two focus areas. The first one is, okay, if I'm the only one having a worry about our quantum designs and finding them or having a bit of suspicions if they're doing so well, 
let's do the good thing a scientist does. Let's test this hypothesis, especially because no one else seems to really worry about it, actually, except from those students I sometimes talk to. So let's try to assess how good quantum models really are. And this is a very big field. So kind of reassess benchmarking, reassess a lot of things that we do, and there's a lot in the pipeline. But the first pilot study I talk about here is just to systematically benchmark popular ideas in quantum machine learning, trying to make the benchmarks as objective as we can. Sounds super boring. Everyone who went onto this project at the beginning was like, oh, I think this is the most exciting piece of research I've done ever, and for various reasons, actually. But um, yeah. And the second one is, um, goes a bit into this direction, and I think, you know, I've, I've tried to find good models for so long, and it's always like, what is my principle to optimize? And I think we should go the other way around. We look into quantum algorithms, we identify what's the core engine, what are they good at, and then we start asking machine learning questions. They have nothing to do with deep learning. And we see what we find. I'll motivate that in the second part. Okay, cool. So first part, and this is where I share like one result that I'm actually really shocked about. I hope <coughs> you're also shocked about this. So a very innocent study. Let's just get a team of very senior researchers together. Let's talk all the time together. We have a good software team. Let's implement the best ben benchmark design we can come up with. This, my realization is it's an art to benchmark well. There are, so, there are millions of questions you have to answer, and we always like ask our students in the first year of PhD to answer those, and they're completely lost. And there's a lot of arbitrariness coming from this. Model selection, we had a lot of procedures. The one we ended up with, take archive papers after 2018 with certain keywords, so we cast a very wide net of trying to get everything that could be related to QML. We only take the one with more than 30 Google Scholar citations. This introduces a very, very serious bias, but one we want. It introduces the bias towards uh, earlier papers that are highly cited. And we want this because um, they're often models that people reproduce that they talk about. So influential papers, but they might not be the most tweaked ones. So just be careful about that. But notably, this excludes your 2017 work. Oh my gosh, that was really bad. No, 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 that was, you mean the one we're both on? Yeah. No, 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 that was published in 2018, sorry. <laughs> no, why we, did, why we did this as well, if you look for classif and uh, archive forever, you find all of this like state classification papers, you just have to go through so many papers. That's... So we literally sat for a week and just went through thousands of papers, right, just to give you an idea of what work this is. Now we limit the uh, topic, we only want NISC, because we can only implement them, only qubit models, only new models. We are only looking at supervised classification and one conventional classical data, so that includes images as well to some extent, but uh, not like something very specific like graph structured data. We randomly select 15 papers because we felt this is what we can implement. Um, and then we realized when we read through the papers properly that some of them, unfortunately, really good ones we can't implement because, for example, they don't give us actually an idea what feature embedding they want or this uh, kind of some gaps. These are the ones we actually had in the final selection. I'll tell you immediately that uh, three of them are not yet um, implemented well enough that I'm confident to share the results because I don't know if you ever did uh, a lot of data analysis, very different from theoretical work. You don't just implement an experiment, but it's almost like a friend you get to know. You have to like do it over and over again. You find a bug, you start not understanding this, you change the setting, and so we've interacted with the other models, not eternally, there's a lot more work to do, but quite a lot. You also see because there's an, an old paper bias that there's actually uh, you know, you know, this is like the paper you were for. I promise this was like uh, accidental, but I'm happy that it's also my own work because you have to criticize your own work as well. Something that comes out. You see um, here this paper, the author's actually in the audience. Oh, yes. Um, uh, Wojtek, and this is um, twice here because it's actually, we used, uh, it proposes two types of models that we kind of like put into different classes. So now one observation here is that um, kind of the types of families of models, I think, are quite representative to what we see in this, the literature of supervised QML. Um, there are these Q and N designs, which I know I also feel is a complete misnomer, but it's the idea of encoding data and then training a variation circuit as a classifier. There are quantum kernel methods, which the idea is you embed quantum data, you compare the quantum states of two embedded data points, and then you feed the result into a classical machine learning algorithm like a support vector machine. There are quantum convolutional, um, neural networks, and there's actually one quantum generative model. Okay, cool. Then you have to decide on tasks. I also try to be quick here. This is like the hardest thing. I think there's a whole research program I want to make about this. Uh, we use binary classification. We optimize the accuracy. And then we use four data sets. The first one is supposed to be the vanilla example. We just sample from a hypercube and use a perceptron model to create a linear decision boundary, and then we label data. Then the one that I really 
don't like being used, but I think the first QML paper actually using it, we realized when we looked for archive was my own, and it's like the worst paper in the entire world. I'm so happy it didn't make a selection because it didn't get cited. But that's MNIST. Obviously, we can't do original MNIST. We have to pre-process it somehow. And this is a very simple problem, by the way, because when you see MNIST results, they use a multi-class classification. In quantum machine learning, we often use binary classification. And this is a very easy problem. So you just get these two blobs, and you have to find some very benign hyperplane or decision boundary that is not very curvy that goes through them. And then what I'm currently working on a lot is to um, donate some more realistic data sets that are based on classical machine learning models of data. First result is that hyperparameters matter. And this is a problem. I'll tell you now why. Let me tell you what you look at. Look at the time. Oh, no, it's actually good. Um, what you look at is the three families of models that we already implemented. We also compare them to uh, classical models from the names. If you know scikit-learn, you realize that we're using a framework. It's a mixture of JAX, Penny Lane, and scikit-learn to do the, um, the hyperparameter optimization. Scikit-learn, by the way, is a super cool framework. I know it sounds a bit like a beginner's framework, but it's actually quite wicked what's, what's in there. And um, MNIST was pre-processed slightly different for the three classes of um, models. And what I'll show you is now the range of accuracies you get from the worst to the best hyperparameter setting. And the hyperparameter grid we use is very, very small because it means how much, you know, it really increases your runtimes of your algorithms. Um, so we used, for example, the three most important hyperparameters of a model. We used a grid of like two or three points, and then we computed every combination of those and kind of ran the model. And so depending on what hyperparameters you have, you get really bad performance or kind of reasonable performance. That's the first insight. Why this is such a problem? All of a sudden, you do not have a benchmarking um, a couple of experiments to run, but every model you have to run hundreds or thousands of experiments. Makes a big headache, I promise. You can see that we only ran our results so far. This is why they're preliminary to eight qubits. Joseph, who's leading the study, he's a very well-spoken British gentleman, but he said if he ever reads a benchmark study up to eight qubits only these days, he would vomit onto the paper. So we're at the moment doing the task of going higher, and this is actually not as, I mean, I open my eyes how hard this actually is for these types of things. Here are the results of the best models. Now, I could now start to try to interpret them, but we're actually really still playing with interpretations. But I want to basically pick out a few items here to show you how hard it is to, to interpret. So at first sight, you would say, okay, the one model class that's actually performing really well, as good as the classical model, are the quantum kernels. But now, I told you that I use different preprocessing, so you should be suspicious. And this class here, I don't use MNIST like the 60,000 data points, but I use 250 subsampled from this data. So this is a much easier problem than the one on the left. But maybe still kernel methods are good because a lot of it is done on a classical computer, so maybe that's good. By the way, these total drops in the models is also not entirely clear to me yet what this is. I think in this model here, this is one of the ones I was involved in, I think it's really just becoming shit. I tried to play around with it and couldn't get it better. There could be convergence issues coming up here. So this is something we still have to study. Now the second thing that maybe, uh, just one second, uh, I'll get to you in a second. The second thing that someone would immediately like comment about is or maybe if I was a first year PhD student and I have this horrible you know, culture of I have to push out a paper in four months time because I do an internship somewhere, I'll probably not say, oh, there's a quantum model that's better than the classical model and this is the dressed quantum circuit classifier. Guess what, the dressed quantum circuit classifier is a paper by Andrea Mari and it uses a neural network, then a quantum circuit and then another neural network. So <laughs> it's really good, oh, it's a neural network. Now, if you consider this, you could say, oh, so but the quantum circuit is making it slightly better. And I read a lot of papers where there's a small line above, and it's like the quantum model is better. Out, let's put the result out. Let's not try to even interact with it. And, um, but there's also a but. It's a bit more complicated. If you see the best uh, neural network in cross-validation is actually much better than the quantum models, for some reason, if we use the test set, and I have no clue why this is even possible, um, the neural network somehow does some strange overfitting. It gets like worse. And I think that if we find out what's happening here, we can actually push this up. Okay, so far so good. And now here's the big bomb I want to drop, at least to me, it was like quite a surprise. So when you benchmark, you should try to break a model. So that's what we try to do. We took our, you know, these models that I'm talking about, they have a lot of, you know, there's a big pipeline, all of it. It's a different loss function, it's different pre-processing, there's a lot of decisions that come from these papers. But what we did, we took the quantum part and replaced the quantum part, however interesting the feature map is or whatever's happening, by a separable circuit. So we encode our data into Pauli rotations that are not entangled, we do our variational part by rotations that are not entangled, we measure something that's not entangled. 
And these are the results. And they're almost the same. <laughs> and this is something I wouldn't show if we haven't consistently seen it over the last months. It's possible that one or two model models still go up and down. There's something super strange here. The circuit-centric model gets so much better. Yeah. And I have a feeling it's because that model introduces a classical bias that it adds. I think this is actually literally what's happening here. Anyways, this model here, which is this um, um, feature map where you encode into an IQP circuit, is the only one, I think, where the separable model gets worse. What's happening here is the feature map actually doesn't only take x1, x2, x3 and encodes it, it also encodes x1 times x2, x1 times x3, and so on and so forth. So it builds higher order features classically and then encodes them. So there's classical pre-processing going on. And when we take the separable model, we switch that off. So maybe that's actually what's happening here. Okay, cool. So that's kind of what it is. I'm interacting with this data really on a daily basis for a long time, and I have started having this feeling here. If you have ever played around with the neural network playground from TensorFlow, you realize that you cannot only put in the immediate features, but you can also build these polynomial features and trigonometric features. And it turns out that all the models are doing this. They build low order trigonometric features or uh, polynomial features. And this increases the performance capacity, but I do not know if this works for larger scales. Uh, one second, I actually totally, wait, where was the question? Oh, I, I'm so sorry, oh yeah. I, I was just wondering, uh, did you run these Models on actual hardware? Oh gosh, no, 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 oh my. Uh, completely simulated, and it's already the biggest headache. Just to give you an, uh, an idea, so this is why I find this research so interesting, because part of my passion is also software, right? Or like, and uh, if you want to push this, so for example, what we use at the moment, we use just-in-time compilation with JAX, makes things really fast, but then you get a problem at some stage you can't compile anymore because things get too big. I also have a memory leak that I realized on the plane, but anyways. And then we have to reroute our entire code to use backends of Penny Lane that use GPUs or high performance computing just to get access to a cluster. Oh my gosh. Yo. Anyways, yes. uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, just a, a, a quick question. Have you taken a look at the uh, performance ability or the performance of these different uh, uh, models as a function of the number of quantum and classical parameters? Because they've got a different number of model parameters. Yeah. So it may not be the fairest comparison. As, as far as I know, it's completely mixed. So there's no correlation between the two. But these will be plots that I'm also like working at the moment to show you basically how the parameters grow. Because it's very mixed. It's very different from each model. Yeah. Because one of the things that I found is that looking at uh, things like the AIC, the distinguish yeah. between different models that have different numbers of parameters, sometimes need to vary different uh, uh, results about what's the whether a quantum or a classical model is preferred. Yes, but what I definitely don't see is that more quantum parameters, more qubits is better, or more layers. Even in the hyperparameter optimization, we hardly ever see that more layers is better. That's something I really find strange, to be honest. Yes? Um, which optimizer do you use? And do you have an assumed noise model, or is it noiseless? Noiseless, completely. Optimizer, oh, good question. Uh, so the way we implement it, and this is, you know, this was like months of discussion of how we do it, is literally to go into the paper and pick out everything they suggest and do. So even if we know this is maybe not the best loss function, you know, someone doesn't use cross entropy, but like, you know, L2 loss, we actually like implemented that. And wherever this wasn't suggested, we try to make reasonable, take reasonable choices. Do you believe that most of these models where they didn't say something, we used Adam? Yes. Um, when you say noiseless, do you also mean no shot noise or you don't shot noise? Yeah, nothing. It's no just shot. perfectly simulated expectation values. Yeah. I've actually never touched noise because I already, I really like working already. This is like really a lot to do. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, uh, for the hyperparameters, did you like randomize the, the hyperparameters? Like, how, did you optimize them? So, yeah, so we do a grid search, a complete grid search. And actually, you could increase the grid, then you would probably have bigger ranges of the model. So this is always like this really difficult choice, where sometimes you can't increase. It. For example, circuit-centric is not doing very well here. And I do believe it could do much better if we increase the grid, but then our, our laptops just die. And as I said, this we, we can only do afterwards. Some models could still like increase, but I do believe also the neural network could increase, because we have a very small grid for that one as well. Yes? Nothing for this model. So, what, what kind of um, number of variation of parameters you have to do? Yeah. Like, thousands or millions? Uh, no, like usually like around 50. But that depends. This is also a hyperparameter how many layers you have in your circuit and they change. Yeah. So, so here is roughly around 50. Yeah. For, for classical and quantum. For the quantum models. For the classical, yeah, as well. I think, yeah. As well, but that's actually a good point. Yeah, we need to actually. So there will be plots added for this. It's actually quite hard 
for every hyperparameter sitting, it's completely different. How many parameters, how many qubits, and so on and so forth. So you would really have to, uh, to visualize this wall. So we're working on that. Just because often I heard classical machine mm. learning, they need, need one million parameters. Yeah. But for example, for the support vector machine, the parameters are the same because you put it into a classical model. Okay, cool. Let me move on because I'm really also super excited about the next topic, which is complete change of energy mentally. <laughs> Um, this is now very deep quantum computing. Not very deep, I'm trying to stay as um, superficial as, because I wasn't like Waterloo trained in quantum computing. So it's a topic that most of you will know, know more about than me. And this is how can we design models from first principles. So let's say our benchmark study showed us that most models are actually crap and we really need better ones. How do we get better ones if we don't have these golden rule of how to build a good machine learning model from classical machine learning? For this, I think we have to go back and ask, how did QNN's quantum neural networks come about? And I think they come explicitly from taking two assumptions. We interpret quantum computing as something that has to do with provable quantum advantage and with NISC circuits. We interpret, interpret machine learning as the state of the art, which is deep learning, you know, big models, uh, gradient descent. And of course, then you get neural networks. They kind of inherit nicely the speed ups of quantum models because you can make them expressive. They use Pauli gates. We can implement on our hardware. They follow the blueprint of deep learning. Let's take a different starting point. Um, and what I want to do in these last slides is really convince you, kind of, not convince you, but like kind of open up this way of thinking, which was a long process for me. Because at any stage of this research, I'm always like, okay, now let's train a variation circuit. And there's, no, that's not what we do. Let's do something different. And I'm not sure where this is leading yet. So this is quantum computing interpreted as solving highly structured problems with interference. And I'll give an example um, to give you an intuition what I mean. And take machine learning as generalizing from samples. No gradient descent, no hardware, no, not even a trainable parameter. Think of Kenya's neighbor. It doesn't have trainable parameters. It's still machine learning. It's actually quite a good algorithm if you ever tried it, yeah. And so I said I was doing family building, so I, I read this book. I don't know if you know it. I read this book to my son a lot, and it's so beautiful. And the places you might go there, I start to be convinced that using these two things as starting points will get us somewhere where we start understanding something that will lead to a better model design. We're not only the first steps of the way yet. Okay, cool. So the example I want to kind of, kind of get these two points across a bit better is period finding. Let's say you've got a couple of integers and you've got a function. Let's say it also maps to integers. And this function is periodic. There are a couple of more requirements you need. And the question is find the period. Um, this sounds very simple, but it's actually an example of a huge class of quantum algorithms, the hidden subgroup problems, and the most famous one is Shor's algorithm, as many of you know. This is where I'm saying, like, you guys probably learned this all at university, um, where I um, didn't. <laughs> and I also only learned group theory this year. My colleague asked me, like, didn't you have a mathematical education? But somehow I just, like, jumped over it in my, in my university. And there, you know, all these, like, words that sound so normal start becoming a larger concept. So the integers become a group, for example, in this case, they're 12. Uh, the function hides cosets of a subgroup, so this is why it's called the hidden subgroup problem, and I try to find a generator of the subgroup. So now let's, uh, so this is basically what I mean by structured problems. Now let's say how do quantum algorithms use interference for structured problems, and I'll just show you a couple of pictures that you have to keep in the back of your mind when you, when you think about this. So what we do as a standard algorithm, textbook algorithm to solve this problem is we put our integers or our x values into a superposition. You know, we interpret them as computational basis states. Then we have this magic oracle that always comes in that kind of knows all the function values and takes an ancilla and uh, writes in the function value into the ancilla state. And by the way, so one of the super cool things about this answer is that I started realizing that it might kick us out of the assumption that there's a perfect oracle. It might start to like, we only have samples of the oracle. I come, I come there just now. Um, the next thing we do is we measure the second register, and what does it do? It only takes the x values out that have the same value, and it actually doesn't matter what we measure here. So I'll just use, you know, we measured one in this case. And I'm almost there. What we do then is the magic thing that we do. If you look into Scott Aronson's talks, for example, uh, he often talks about Fourier being the one thing <laughs> that is actually like interesting, especially in the paper that Nathan mentioned. You apply a quantum Fourier transform, and what you do is you create a superposition with these amplitudes that you see here, and you see it's super structured, right? And then the magic happens of interference. I just like wrote different, you know, I've evaluated these values numerically that you see this better. In those darkly highlighted states, what you get is constructive interference, because these ones here are all integer values of, um, 
you know, the exponential function. So you get like ones here. By the way, I, I forgot about normalization here. So constructive interference. And this one here, in this column, you always have ones, but the rest of this, the amplitudes will give you um, exactly minus one, and so you get a negative interference. And by the way, if you know group theory, then these are uh, obviously like irreducible representations. And so what you get is actually also a very simple state, and this is what I mean by the solution comes from interference. Why is this a solution? Actually, I was super surprised that in hidden subgroup problems, uh, how you get the solution out of the final state after the quantum Fourier transform is not so simple to, to do. But in this case, it's actually very simple because all of these states have the property that's an integer times 12, which is the size of the group, divided by the number you want to get, and you can get this out of a few samples. Okay, cool, I'm almost ready, uh, done, um, with kind of what I'm trying to say here. And by the way, uh, you're probably expecting also like a huge preliminary result that I'll show you now. This is the new model class. This won't come. The preliminary result is literally a question that we're asking in research now. But I promise this took us half a year to get this question. And sometimes this is not the wrong way to do things. So interpret quantum computing as solving highly structured problems with interference. Now let's put in machine learning. And I think you know where this is going. Machine learning generalizing from samples. So let's say we don't have an oracle, but we have something, something that we started talking about as a datarized oracle. If you know any papers or research directions that do this already, I'm almost sure people have thought about this from another direction, then please let me know. So what happens if I only have a constant number of actually examples of what the oracle does? Let's go very quickly visually through this algorithm. So for example, if I measure one now, so I kind of kept the state here, I won't have some of the states. I will only have very few of the states left. What happens in the interference pattern is that some columns will be blacked out and won't exist. And what it does to the columns of, uh, of the rows of constructive interference is the same thing. They're still constru constructively interferes, but the amplitude is linearly smaller. The destructive interference gets destroyed. And uh, we started off thinking like maybe there's a, a certain probability distribution of data that doesn't destroy this. So this was like, we went at the beginning. So to give you an example where I plot kind of the final distribution that you measure from your hidden subgroup problem, uh, if you have a perfect oracle, you get nice peaks, and then if you have 10% of your oracle, you get kind of these interference, and it gets worse and worse. And now I'm actually finished. Now I tell you two questions that we're currently investigating. They're kind of slightly different flavors of this. And the first thing is, can we amplify the signal in Fourier sampling? This is called Fourier sampling, basically sampling from this distribution. So still, these peaks are still very structured. So is there a way to still get out what we want if the oracle, so generalized from a lower, from datarized oracle, basically? And the second question that's a bit different is, can we learn to reconstruct the oracle from data? So we get given only a couple of states. Can we kind of recover the full structure and then just run the HSP? And now, who's in the room who doesn't now immediately think, oh, let's train a variation circuit? <laughs> and obviously, like, but the question is, what we don't want to use arbitrary ansatz. So at the moment, we're really working on trying to find a very clear way that uses the inductive bias that this problem gives us that is highly structured to really see how we can solve this task. Yes, I'm actually done as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's, let's clap first. Uh, oh.